What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Listography. It is time for Album of the Year, and today we are tackling our five favorite records from the year 1988. To me, 88 coming out of 87, which I think was probably my favorite year of the decade. My numbers 6 through 10 for 87 um, were really strong. Um, 88, a bit, little bit weaker, um, but there's definitely some good stuff on it as well. So what's going on in 88 as far as the music scene goes? Um, to me, this is sort of in 87, kind of the height of hair metal a little bit. You've really lost a lot of that British new wave stuff from the early 80s. Not completely, but I think it's much stronger now with a little bit of hair metal and some really bombastic um, solo stuff from George Michael, Michael Jackson, Madonna, Whitney Houston, Bobby Brown. You also got a lot of hip hop elements, two monumental hip hop albums that come out this year with NWA and Public Enemy. Um, both of those just kind of missed my cutoff. Um, I will not have a lot of hip-hop contenders. I did a couple years ago, um, one make the list, maybe in the early 90s, possibly, but these ones just missed. So yeah, hair metal pretty big right now. You've got a terrific show on MTV called Headbangers Ball, which was awesome. You've got the Hall of Fame kind of in full swing and gaining popularity. They induct Bob Dylan, the Beatles, the Beach Boys, and I think sort of that realization and that saturation of classic rock is 20 years old now and you've got a generation that was a little bit raised on it that's kind of kind of play into um, the Seattle scene and some more guitar heavy and more you know we're really going to strip away the eyeliner and the makeup soon and get into grunge um, but for now it is pop and hair metal your top singles of the year are reaching number one are faith by George Michael Need You Tonight by In Excess, Everyone Gets Rickrolled with Never Gonna Give You Up by Rick Astley, Sweet Child of Mine from Guns N' Roses, and George Harrison gets in there as well with Get My Mindset on You. I've got some good albums to make the top five. I've got some albums to quickly talk about that didn't make it, but let's see what you guys got. I, I really have no clue what either of your picks are gonna be. It was a little predictable for 87 for me for you guys, but I'm excited for this. Let's see what you got. Like you said, a lot of different stuff going on with pop and hair metal. I think this is a really kind of diverse time in music because you've also got a lot of really cool kind of like college radio type stuff happening, 120 minutes. And I also think you sort of start to see the beginning of kind of like alt country in these late 80 years as well. So going to be interesting. This might be where we start to split paths a little, but I think we'll maybe come back together in the early 90s as well. So for my five, well, I'll start with a few that just missed my list. Surfer Rosa is really tough to leave off, but it probably is my least favorite of the initial run of the Pixies. That may be surprising to some, but I prefer their others. Fisherman's Blues by the Waterboys is a just miss. Also Daydream Nation by Sonic Youth, Lincoln by They Might Be Giants, and Buenos Noches from a Lonely Room by Dwight Yoakam. But the ones that make my list, I've got the self-titled record from Lucinda Williams, uh, which has a lot of great tunes on it. Just Wanted to See You So Bad, Passionate Kisses, Change the Locks, really front to back. Just a lot of great songs, great vocals and her band on it is really good as well. Uh, my next pick is another kind of uh, country-ish uh, record. I've got Shadowland by Katie Lang, um, one of my favorite vocalists ever, and she teams up with Owen Bradley, who is kind of the architect of the Nashville sound. He produced a lot of Patsy Cline's big records, and he really brings a, a great authenticity to Katie's sound on this record. It's really, really good. I've also got Green by R.E.M., which is my favorite R.E.M. record. I've got Bug by Dinosaur Jr., but my number one is Love Junk by The Pursuit of Happiness. This record is just fantastic. Produced by Todd Rundgren, The Pursuit of Happiness, Canadian rock band. This record is just so good and it does such a good job of it capturing the feeling that I think a lot of people have when they're in their kind of late teens, early 20s. It's got kind of like this uh, cocky and self-assured, almost like punk rock attitude, but also has this like self-deprecation all through it. It's like ready to take on the world, but also you kind of hate yourself. And the lyrics are funny and just sarcastic and 
It's so good. One of the most underrated albums ever, I think. More people really need to know about this record. It's really good. Yeah, it's got that really cool feel of being young and hopeful and you're ready to drive across the country, but God damn it, where are my car keys? Like, that's kind of like what it feels like. It, it's, it's, it's perfect. Uh, unfortunately, they never really were able to match it, but it's, it's a really, really great one-off. Yes, you know, it's kind of the album we all grew to love together and started our friendship, really, if you think back. Uh, I still remember Jason... Or maybe it was Cramsey who played it for me. I forget who, but I still remember it's it's a fantastic album. It is on my top five, but just missing my top five. This this for me, this is a pretty weak year in general. I kind of had to dig around to find my top five here. And I, yes, you were right, Jason. We are definitely going in different directions. Um, for me, this is this is all metal, basically in 1988, including my Uncle's band, Just Missing, Kingdom Come with their self-titled. Good album. Not not my favorite of Michael Dan's work, but nonetheless, very good. Royal Jelly's good. Uh, oh, yeah, that's that's in contention for later. A lot of albums like, I kind of like. Now and Zen from Our Plants. Love Sexy from Prince. Green from R.E.M. But none of those make the lists. All just albums I like, but don't. Don't love. So my top five is going to be from Metallica, finally making the list. And this year of metal, I got Injustice for All. Really strong, just really dark, depressing. I almost left it off because I feel like I'm not in that kind of mood lately. But uh, on, on second listen, it's pretty darn good. Just a lot of really heavy, just uh, metal. Uh, also making my list in the same kind of universe, we got Operation Mind Crime from Queensryche, kind of cool. It's like prog metal, you know, it has this kind of convoluted story to go along with it, which it's fine. There's a lot of sort of asides and like little one minute snippets, which I don't love, but the songs that are on there are pretty sweet. Just kind of a cool album. If you like that kind of thing. Also on my list, I got Vivid from Living Color. I love, 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 love. The Call of Personality, one of my favorite songs of all time, if not my favorite rock song of all time. Love that riff, awesome stuff. But, you know, very diverse. They kind of go poppy for Glamour Boys, Middleman, Open Letter to Landlord. You know, social conscious mixed with just brutally heavy hard rock in some times. Um, Mick Jagger's on the album, singing backups. Cool band. I wish they had done more, and I wish they got more recognition. Uh, also on my list, The Pursuit of Happiness with Love Junk. Just a really fun power pop, college rock kind of thing. Todd Rundgren, great production. Really cool. Great guitar. Great everything. Like Jason said, he was not wrong in any of his uh, comments on it. But number one, I got to go with... My boys and Iron Maiden finally reaching the top spot with Seventh Son of a Seventh Son. Their first album with keyboards, which people did not like. Sort of more in the prog rock world, maybe a little bit. You know, there's, there's nothing like Alexander the Great or Aces High where it's based on a true story. This is all kind of, you know, Taken from, I guess, a book. Orson Scott Cards, Seventh Son. It's, you know, like Operation Mind Crime. It's sort of this convoluted story. It doesn't matter. The guitars are awesome. Bruce Dickinson is awesome. Steve Harris, awesome bass lines. It's big. Uh, it's sort of proggier, so there's more kind of time changes and structure changes and some different elements that you probably didn't get from them before. Uh, didn't do great in America because it was too European sounding because they added keyboards, and that was a big deal in the 80s for metal bands not to do. It's also the last one with Adrian Smith for a while, and it just rocks. It just rules. It's a great, great album. Maybe the best Iron Maiden album. Definitely their last sort of awesome uh, from their prime album. And uh, a pretty easy pick for number one in 1988 for me. I didn't even consider any metal or any of those albums or any of the alt country stuff Jason brought up. So yes, we are really going to go through a little bit of a period of separation here. When I was 
comprising my list, it wasn't clear who the winner was going to be. And then the more I kind of went and re-listened, it became pretty clear. The trickiest thing here was finding the fifth spot. I had like eight in contention for that fifth spot. The two um, hip hop albums I mentioned, um, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back by Public Enemy and Straight Outta Compton. Tracy Chapman's debut was kind of considered Starfish by the Church, Bug by Dinosaur Jr. But the one that did get the final nomination is going to be Blue Bell Knoll by Cocteau Twins. I also have The Pursuit of Happiness with Love Junk. So the three of us nominating it, thank God, I was worried one of us might not. Let this be a nice uh, flyer for anyone that doesn't know this album. It is a little bit tricky to find. I'm sure you can find it on YouTube, but it's awesome. I've also got Daydream Nation by Sonic Youth and Surfer Rosa by Pixies, but rejoice fans. My winner is R.E.M. Green. Like I said, the more and more I really put it up against the other albums, the more it became clear that it was my winner. And I do kind of like this more poppy, jangly version of them. It's a little bit less serious, maybe a little bit. I don't want to say the earlier stuff is pretentious, but they definitely made a case to be more accessible. And, you know, even though they're kind of still saying a lot of the same things, the presentation is entirely different. They actually, I was reading, made it a point to say, we're not going to write any typical REM songs in this album. We want major keys. We want a lot of like eclectic electric variety on it. And you, you get it. I think it's a really great, you know, jangly guitar pop album. I love Get Up, Love Stand, World Lead Pretend, Wrong Child, Pop Song 89. Orange Crush, I think is probably my favorite hit of theirs. I just think it's great all the way through. And this will kind of mark um, the big part of my era of REM fandom from Document up through Monster, even though I do like the older stuff too. Um, I don't think there's going to be a big problem with REM making some of my lists in the next several years. I do, th I, this or Document is probably my favorite REM record, but I think that Peter Buck is just an incredibly underrated guitar player. I know when, you know, Rolling Stone redid their guitar list. I think he was on it on the new one, and it's nice to see him get that appreciation because um, he does have a really cool style and he drives the songs a lot more than people realize. I actually, I, as much as I love R.E.M., I'm not crazy about Michael Stipe all the time. I mean, I can't imagine them having anyone else as the singer, but to me, it's it's more about the band than I think mo more people give credit for. So I think this album is just fantastic. You know, it's like I said, just like a jangly guitar pop record. And it's just awesome. All the songs are catchy, but not not cheesy or corny. They all have a lot of depth and meaning to them. And you know, it's just it's just a cool approach that they did for this vastly different. And it works tremendously for me. Any closing thoughts on 1988 or where we might be going as the 80s close out? 89 is such a weird year compared to 88. It's, it's interesting. I'm ahead of the game with my listening and it's just interesting to see the, the difference in kind of quality and quantity of every year for me. Like 87 is so good, 88 was meh, 89 is just completely packed full. If people had just released albums one year earlier or later, they'd be number one on my list. I don't know what they were thinking. Like, get it together, guys. I think um, for me, 89 is a tiny bit weaker than the past two years, but it's still got um, some good stuff. I haven't got my final five narrowed down yet, but I've got my long list and it's looking uh, looking pretty strong. Winding down in the 80s, we all were ready to concede that just wasn't going to be as good as the 70s, but better than you thought, especially with you, Jason? Um, early 80s, not better than I thought, worse than I thought, mid to late 80s, about what I thought. Com completely the opposite of what Jason just said. Early 80s is just packed full of greatness. I don't know. I kind of bounce around. I, I like the decade a good bit. I wouldn't say it's better than the 70s, but I definitely probably like it more than you guys do. And I once we finally do our top whatever number albums we're going to do, our favorite albums lists, I think my the 80s are going to be pretty well represented for me. But uh, anyway, uh, thanks everybody for watching. Um, 1988 is now in the past. We were looking at 89 and then the 90s coming up. Um, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell for notifications. And also check us out on social media on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. You can get that information in the description 
let us know in the comments what you're thinking for 88. And maybe by now you guys kind of know us a good bit. So what are we going to do in 89? Um, so let us know. Take your guesses. And we will see you next time on Listography.